humans are an inherently social species. It forms as the fundamental distinction between us and the rest of the animal kingdom. We can collaborate in large groups, produce religions, corporations, the Olympics. Lots of weird concepts that really only work because we agree to do it together. We play sport, climb social hierarchies, seek the approval of our colleagues, friends and family. The people within our immediate environment create the fabric by which we navigate our lives. We identify as people in groups and without them, we lose something very central to our identity. Okay, that was incredibly dramatic, but you see my point. Socializing is integral to our species. All of the social interactions we have had up until this point define how our individual brains work, how different regions connect with each other, how we probe and interact with the environment and how we respond to different stimuli. Our brain at birth and throughout our lives is sculpted like a stonemason with a chisel on a blank limestone canvas. Every hit being comparable to a social interaction or a stimulus that invariably changes the course of the object and the functionality of the system forever. So what happens when all of this socializing just goes away? We're left with an incomplete, unfinished sculpture left to just weather by the elements. Now, the analogy isn't perfect. Socializing is by no means the only thing that's capable of inducing neural change or what's called plasticity. All of the sensory information that's picked up by our squadron of sensory receptors like sight, smell, hearing, taste, pain, temperature, touch, all of these different things are capable of altering how the brain functions. But it is socializing that acts as the chisel at your frontal lobes. This brain region is implicated in decision making and executive function. It effectively regulates your behavior, how you act day to day. There's a rather startling and very disturbing example of exactly what happens to an animal when they are placed under these conditions of complete sensory deprivation. The story tracks back to the 1970s in the University of Wisconsin with the professor Harry Harlow. He's a very well respected neuroscientist of his time, but upon the tragic passing of his wife he plunged into a deep depression and his experiments took a very dark turn. Dr. Harlow separated rhesus monkeys from their mothers very shortly after birth and placed them in these steel cages that they couldn't see out of, completely deprived of all sensory experience. He literally called these pits of despair. He kept these monkeys in these cages without any experience for times varying from three weeks to over a year. I really can't think of anything more horrible and cruel. See, this was a time where there were literally no ethical conducts or ethical concerns of any regard for these researchers to follow. This precipitated a series of social psychology experiments which are infamous now for their horribly unethical conduct. These include Philip Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment, which even though it's kind of glorified in its movie form, still was just a bit horrible for everyone involved. Also Watson and Rayner's Little Albert Experiment. What happened in this study was a young boy was conditioned to be absolutely terrified of a white rat. Somehow this fear generalized to all things of the color white, to the point that the boy became hysterical at the mere sight of Watson's beard. It took an actual illegal raid of a research lab in 1985 by PETA volunteers to expose some of the horrible conditions that our primate ancestors were being placed in. This was actually the first step in a very lengthy court case which established some of the lab ethical practices that we still have today. The results from Harlow's monkeys really outline how important and critical these measures were to implement. The monkeys emerged from their pits of despair completely reclusive, depressed, devoid of all emotion. They literally had to be force fed to be kept alive. Their will to live had gone, no spirit, no joy, nothing. It was like they were empty. It's tragically sad. So I wanted to know more about what would happen in the absence of this chisel. In some way or another we are all experiencing different levels of social isolation in quarantine and I didn't exactly know how bad this was for our mental health and well-being. So to figure out more I wanted to talk to Dr. Redmond O'Connell. He's a social neuroscientist at Trinity College Dublin and I think he had a few interesting things to say on the topic. I think it, 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 it's clearly going to have major effects on mental health across the board, obviously to different degrees, depending on people's vulnerabilities and their situations. 
I mean, we know we know again, like that amongst elderly people, isolation is a is a um, uh, a, a major factor in accelerating cognitive decline. Yeah. Just to take that, that particular example, um, and and with social isolation, it's actually uh, the research suggests it's it's not just down to like the pure number of interactions that you're having. Mm-hmm. It's that what's most important is your perception of whether you feel isolated. Right. Or not. Yeah. You feel isolated. You see um, really negative effects in terms of long term uh, cognitive well being, cognitive functioning. Um, so, you know, general cognitive stimulation is, is known to be a really important factor in maintaining good brain health, cognitive function. Um, and particularly amongst elderly people that, or people who have like reduced mobility, uh, increased frailty, the opportunities for cognitive stimulation are reduced. Right. And it becomes that bit more important to have like regular social interaction as well. Um, and so COVID is taking away some of those opportunities. Um, you know, the, I, I think there's a lot then, obviously, that we get from physical proximity from, uh, you know, in terms of the quality of communication that we can have with one another. Like, we're really lucky that we're living through an era or th- those of us who have access to the Internet and computers that we're living through the Zoom era. Absolutely. So I think that that's certainly helping to soften the blow. Um, but I would but we, we know, too, though, that there that that there's no replacement for actual direct contact and physical proximity, all sorts of, you know, psychological benefits of touch and um, uh, body language and, 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 and all of that. So, um, yeah, there, there's going to be a range of negative effects for everybody. Something Dr. Redmond said that was of particular interest to me was about the importance on the perception of the social isolation. Like most things in our life, it's the perception of the event rather than its objective nature that defines how our brain is sculpted. This is why people react in such unpredictable ways to the same stimuli. It's because their perceptual experience is different, whether this is from conscious or subconscious processes. Interestingly, we actually have a lot more control over these conscious processes than people might think. There are some really extreme but interesting examples of this. People like Wim Hof are able to expose their bodies to extremely low temperatures beyond what should be physiologically possible. See, what's interesting here is that heat is an objective quantity. It measures the motion of atoms in a structure. Within cold bodies, atoms move slowly. They jitter, sliver around each other. Within hot bodies, the atoms become maniacal. They shoot around the place and they're highly energetic. That's what energy means is the motion of atoms. Our perception of heat is produced through these things called thermoreceptors. They reside in our skin. See, they pick up this atomic motion. They transduce the signal into a electrical signals. Electricity is the language of the brain. The signal propagates through wherever the area in contact with the skin was, all the way through, up through our spinal cord and into our brain. More specifically, the somatosensory cortex. This is the region where all sensation occurs. What Wim Hof figured out is pretty amazing. What he was able to discover in conjunction with a team of scientists is that his deep breathing technique was able to naturally elevate levels of painkillers in his body. These are endogenous painkillers called opiates and cannabinoids, the same kind to which the recreational drugs take their name. So what these endogenous painkillers do is that they attempt to inhibit the signal as it transfers from your skin to your brain. The result of this dampening of the electric signal is a decrease in the magnitude of the perception. This is what allows Wim Hof to do his absolutely crazy Wim Hof-like stuff. Now, you could make the argument that emotions aren't the same thing as a physical stimulus like heat. But that's not technically correct. Emotion, in the same way heat is, is just patterns of electricity. Just in the case of emotion, it's an infinitely complex electrical pattern. Brains are purely electrical in the same way that computers are binary. They operate in zeros and ones. The complexity of the systems arise from the infinite permutations that these can be organized into. So in the same way that we can develop mechanisms to dampen the electrical signal of a physical stimulus, we can actually develop mechanisms to dampen the signal of an emotional stimulus or a troublesome one like the one we're all experiencing in social isolation. Dr. Rick Hansen is an American neuropsychologist and he's kind of the pioneer of this method. He lays it out in his book Hardwiring Happiness, a book that I've recommended to countless friends and I'd really recommend it to anyone that's listening. 
He has a really great quote in the book which really resonated with me and is very on topic for this video. He says, what flows through your attention sculpts your brain. The logical extension of this is that if you can control what you focus your attention on, you control what you can focus your consciousness on, then you can partially regulate what alters your brain's function. This is a simple idea and one that people might smirk at, but you really can't underestimate the impact of your day-to-day -day actions on neuroplasticity. You are what you act out. This is termed experience-dependent neuroplasticity. It's been shown that enriching positive emotion, practicing compassion, gratitude, and other inner strengths increases your natural ability to buffer stress, depression, anxiety, other things that plague our society. Now this is a slow and arduous process and it's by no means simple and I'm by no means an expert. I complain all of the time, but when I do, I really try and frame the argument in the scope of everything else I have going on in life at that time. Once you try and even make the comparison, you realize how insignificant most of these complaints are. The reason that this process is difficult to maintain is because humans have an inherent negativity bias. The way Rick describes this in the book is that humans are sponges to negative emotion. We soak up all negative emotion around us, but we're Teflon shields to positive. It takes so much for us to really take in positive experiences when they happen. And that means that they don't form the longer lasting neural structures we need to maintain that positivity as time goes on. All we do is form these negative neural structures, these neural networks, and it just contributes to bad mental health and it really can be detrimental. People's vulnerability to negative emotion is also highly genetically variable, which means that these people who have unfortunately just inherited these faulty, unoptimal genes are just going to have to devote that much more conscious effort to attaining the same level of mental well-being. I really do think it makes a difference though, and the science supports this. If anyone is interested in reading up on any of the papers that I use to research for this video, then I'll link them all below. It actually makes for a very interesting read. In regards to what specific things to try, I don't feel comfortable giving a list. People are too different. I feel like when people give advice online and they tell someone to go do something specific and they go do that, but then perhaps they don't attain the same results, they put the blame on them and they kind of give up hope. People are different and there's no reason why people would find joy from doing the same thing. The only advice I would give is to not divide your attention. The research has been clear on this for a very long time. Multitasking doesn't exist. What happens is we're task switching. This is extremely cognitively demanding. When we're doing two tasks at the same thing, our brain is actually flipping between two default states to try and devote your attention to each one. It reduces the amount of flow that's possible and you just will not get the same conscious involvement in that thing. Focus all of your consciousness on the topic as much as you can, let it enrich you. Stretch your abilities to the absolute maximum of what you think you can achieve and then be grateful that you have the ability to feel that effect. That's what I've tried to do in this video, and it's by no means perfect. It's not even good compared to the incredible content that exists here on YouTube, but I'm very dedicated to improving my video editing, improving my storytelling and my depth in neuroscience so that I can make better videos for you. If by some miracle you're still watching this, hi, my name's Evan. I'm a fourth year neuroscience student in Trinity and I'm fascinated with the brain and how it works. If you've enjoyed this kind of video and maybe you want to learn more about the brain, then I'd really appreciate a like and subscribe. It's incredible that you've stayed this long. I really appreciate your attention and your time. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time.